Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion On Air podcast. This podcast is a program of the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges Diversity Matters Initiative. The podcast explores various issues related to diversity and inclusion in the veterinary profession and provides the AAVMC an opportunity to offer ongoing diversity programming to our member institutions as well as all veterinary professionals. My name is Dr. Lisa Greenholm, the Chief Diversity Officer here at the AAVMC. This is a very, very special episode. I feel like it's like the after school special, but this is a very special episode for me as I get to talk to one of my very favorite veterinary people, Dr. Willie Reed, Dean of the Purdue University College of Veterinary Medicine. Dean Reed is the inaugural recipient of the American Veterinary Medical Association's Frederick Douglass Patterson Lifetime Achievement Award. The award created earlier this year recognizes individuals who have made contributions to the veterinary profession through innovative and transformative leadership in promoting DEI. Now, before we get into my conversation with Willie, I'd like to share some facts about the awards namesake, Dr. Frederick Douglass Patterson. Of course, he was named after the great famed abolitionist Frederick Douglass. Um, he uh, was a graduate of Prairie View A&M University, uh, Iowa State's College of Veterinary Medicine and Cornell University, um, where he earned his PhD. Of course, he was also, um, Dr. Patterson was also the president of Tuskegee University, where he also founded what is now the College of Veterinary Medicine. He also founded the United Negro College Fund, UNCF, um, the famed Tuskegee Airmen, um, who Loki had a spotless record um, of flights during World War II, by the way. And among other things, he also worked to improve low income housing in Tuskegee, Alabama, by moving construction from wood to what became known as the Tuskegee Concrete Block. Um, so, from kind of wood construction to concrete construction. And that really became the preferred approach for low income housing in the US, but also abroad. There is is so much that we could say about Dr. Patterson. I don't know how he did it. I don't know how he found time. Um, all I do know is that he was that dude. That's what we would say in 2023. He was really that dude. He just was everywhere doing all kinds of really amazing things and left an amazing legacy um, behind. And so um, he was really, uh, Dr. Patterson was really an amazing individual. And so is my guest today, Dean Willie Reed. How's it going? Well, it's going fine, uh, Lisa. Thank you for those very kind words. I, I really appreciate that. That's very thoughtful of you. Uh, no, you're you're um, really just such a light in my life. Um, I started out in vet med many, many what well, seems like many years ago, um, but I've been around for a lot of people's, most of a good chunk of people's careers now. And so, um, but you've always been so supportive and just um, a really kind ear to listen to my rants, to my, <laughs> my yeah, reads right. and all of those kinds of things. So thank you personally for me. You're, you're, you're very welcome. And certainly you have been very supportive of our programs here at Purdue and you know, had an opportunity to visit us and participate in some of our programs over the years. So we really appreciate that. Yes, absolutely. So um, as is our custom on the show, why don't you introduce us to you? Tell us a little bit about um, yourself and um, your hero origin story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, I grew up in a very small rural uh, community in uh, South uh, South Alabama. I, I often re- we refer to it as uh, L- L.A., and that's uh, lower Alabama, uh, not too far from the big city of Mobile, which is right on the coast. And so uh, that's that's where I grew up. And uh, yeah, I grew up in an interesting time uh, that was, was right during uh, uh, the heights of um, uh, desegregation. And uh, it was a, a tough time to to grow up and. I, you know, I grew up in a, as I often describe to my students here at Purdue, it was a time and a place where, um, for many, dreams were just dreams, and uh, few had an opportunity to see those dreams become uh, fulfilled. And I felt like I was one of the lucky ones. I, um, I had a dream, and I was able to pursue that with support from uh, family, a mother, father, grandmothers, and and many other relatives that um, gave me the uh, encouragement to keep pursuing my degree, but dream. 
but I saw many of my high school classmates, they did not have that great support that I had. So uh, some very talented individuals, uh, you know, just they, they didn't succeed their dream fulfilled. And, you know, you talked about Dr. Patterson starting the United Negro College Fund and you know, one the slogan there is a is a you know, mine is a terrible thing to to waste, but which is true. But for me, uh, I looked at it as a a dream is a terrible thing to waste. So, so that's where I you know I grew up and around all kinds of animals and uh, rural environment. And I had a father who uh, was really interested in veterinary medicine. I think that was his dream. But during the era when he he was growing up that was an impossible dream. And so I think he pushed that dream towards me. And growing up, I always had an interest in um, science and medicine, and of course, love for animals, but didn't want to pursue human medicine. And so it was veterinary medicine uh, that uh, attracted me. Uh, and it was because of my father and also had a vocational agriculture teacher who really kind of pushed me in that direction as, as well. And so it was about, I don't know, 10th, 11th grade when I thought, veterinary medicine is for me. So, it, you know, for a lot of, uh, at least some of my students, uh, they they tell me that, oh, you know, they wanted to be a veterinarian ever since they were five years old. Well, that wasn't necessarily true for me. <laughs> it took <laughs> a little bit longer before I, um, I uh, really latched on the profession, and probably because I, you know, didn't really have any role models, uh, didn't, didn't, didn't see veterinarians, uh, period. And in fact, I, I saw uh, a veterinarian, uh, had an encounter with a veterinarian twice uh, when I was growing up. Uh, he came to uh, treat uh, one of our horses. We had a couple of horses and he treated one of our dogs uh, on site. You know, we didn't go to the veterinary clinic. And so that was the only two, uh, two times. And I remember one time uh, he came and our dog had a, had a condition that, well, I, I later discovered it was called tick paralysis. And uh, the animal was par paralyzed, and it's because of a reaction to a tick. And so you you extract the tick, and the animal gets better. And I just couldn't believe that that was possible. <laughs> <laughs> of course, in those days, you know, you didn't go to the internet uh, to to Google it. You could yeah, right. a possibility. And the uh, the library, my you know little rural school, didn't have the resources. And so, who knows if that was true? So that always intrigued me. And then uh, another uh, another uh, situation always intrigued me too was my my grandmother who lived with us. She she loved to raise uh, chickens and turkeys. Okay. And uh, she always kept them together. And the turkeys never would survive. The turkeys always died. Chickens were fine. And that that intrigued me too. And I said, well, why was that? Why is why did that happen? Yeah. And it was until I got into vet school that I really discovered what was killing my grandmother's turkeys. And it was a disease uh, called histomoniasis. And it's caused by a protozoal organism and is carried by uh, a parasite that inhabits the uh, intestines of chickens. Oh. And, and so the chicken uh, is fine, but then they, they uh, contaminate the, the environment and the turkeys pick up this pathogen and it kills the turkeys. So those those two episodes really intrigued me about uh, veterinary medicine, and so it played a big role in partly a role in me deciding to pursue it. So wow, wow! So just two actual veterinary exposures. Well, yeah, two actual I mean, two formal exposures, formal exposures, and, <laughs> and probably together we're talking about less than two hours. Yeah. So. Uh, as you know, many veterinary schools require hours and hours and hours for young people to be considered, right, to get yeah. admitted. And, and I thought, well, I never would have been admitted to probably any of my vet schools, you know, because I didn't have the hours of veterinary experience. I had lots of animal experience. And uh, and uh, when I used to, uh, well, when I was working for another institution, then, you know, they had a requirement for lots of veterinary hours. And I used to always push back on that and say, please tell me, tell me, uh, show me the data that, that says if I have all these hundreds of maybe thousands of hours of uh, veterinary experience, that that's going to make me a better veterinarian than someone that has very little, very few hours. When we tell young people all the time that veterinary medicine is a profession of many choices and that everybody goes into clinical practice and 
And furthermore, if you if you look at me, I think I turned out okay. I think with you only did okay. Two <laughs> And so I, I'm not, a, you know, certainly there's nothing wrong with having veterinary experience. Who yeah. can argue against that? But it shouldn't be an obstacle to admitting uh, young people into veterinary medicine. Yes, um, I am. Uh, like, I'm, I'm like so eager to go down. You know that that's like my favorite rabbit hole. To go yeah, down yeah. Down. Um, so that was a long answer to your question. <laughs> and so no, anyway, anyway, so oh, yeah. I'm interested in school. And, um, you know, that time, uh, I think probably there were only 17 or 18 veterinary colleges in the country. Wow. And um, the only one that I knew of was, uh, uh, well, I knew about two, I guess, in Alabama. There's two, Auburn and, and Tuskegee University. And my my father was always, he, he was very impressed by uh, a, a Tuskegee veterinarian that uh, worked for USDA that he, mm. he, he would interact with, I guess, a few times. And so he talked about Tuskegee and uh, uh, he talked about uh, the Tuskegee Airmen. Yeah. He had been in Tuskegee uh, growing up. He, he didn't actually, I don't think he went to school there, but well, he didn't go to school there, but he was in that area. And in fact, he told me he used to drive Mr. Bethune Cookman around. Uh, really? How about that? And <laughs> uh, and so uh, he, uh, you know, he talked up uh, veterinary medicine all the time. And and so that was really the only option for me. And, you know, the other veterinary school in Alabama, of course, I don't think that that time they had graduated a single African-American and uh, so I didn't even consider applying. And the notion of going out of state for any kind of education yeah. was just not something that uh, was was possible. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. Tuskegee was the only place for me. And so I applied, uh, was accepted into pre-vet and uh, did my pre-vet work there. And, and then of course got into veterinary school and um, and the rest is history, I guess. <laughs> wow. So um, I have to just say, one, that this means I only have one, two, like three hops to a connection to um, <laughs> Bethune Cook. Because <laughs> like, I'm always like, let's play the, play the yeah. Kevin Pagan yeah. uh, uh, um, uh, game yes. on connections to um, famous civil yeah. rights folks. So thank you for uh, giving me another. Connection. Yeah, I mean, I, I was, yeah, he, 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 that's what he told me. I, and so <laughs> it's been an amazing story. He, he, he would uh, drive her around Tuskegee. That's so so cool. she that's was so visiting, cool. Tusk she was visiting Tuskegee. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, in vet school, I he had a great, you know, great time and, and, um, what I remember about vet school at Tuskegee was I uh, had wonderful, wonderful instructors mm. that were very committed to the students, very committed to the institution and the profession. And it was in the second year of veterinary school that I had these wonderful pathology professors, and they uh, changed my whole uh, career plans. I mean, when I left my little little town in uh, South Alabama. My plan was to go to vet school, I'd come back and I would open a veterinary practice and I would be the second veterinarian in my little county. And I would treat, you know, all creatures yeah. great and small. <laughs> <laughs> but it was not it was that second year when I was taking pathology and I thought, wow, I really like this. And I had, again, I had these wonderful uh, professors that inspired me. And uh, then I had a chance to um, spend a summer uh, working for the old Upjohn company in Kalamazoo, Michigan in their pathology department, just to see if this yeah. is something I would I would like. And that, it was an interesting experience. And then uh, the next summer, I had an opportunity to work at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, in their comparative pathology department. So there I wow. got a chance to, uh, to, to work uh, in the area of uh, comparative pathology, mostly dealing with laboratory animals and also a little bit of human pathology. Cool. And uh, then after these two experiences, I uh, decided, you know, I, I, I want to pursue pathology. Okay. I don't want to return to my little hometown and open the, the practice. And, and I remember when I told my father this, oh, he was devastated. I bet, like I <laughs> see dead animals. <laughs> I, I thought, you know, he, he uh, just knew I was going to return home 
have a practice and he probably was going to hang out with me sometime i bet you know and, li and live live li live through me his dream you know yeah and, um, and, what, and when I was working at Kalamazoo uh, at the old Love John Company, uh, you know, before it later became pharmacy and then Pfizer yeah. and, you know, now Zoetis, uh, um, I met a Purdue, Purdue grad, a pathologist, and he was actually a Tuskegee graduate. And he had, wow. he had just finished his PhD in uh, uh, pathology and was working there. And his wife, uh, his name was Richard Hughes, and his wife was Doris Hughes. And Doris had uh, completed two years of her training at, at Tuskegee and then transferred here to Purdue. And uh, Doris finished her DVM here at Purdue. In fact, she's the first African-American graduate uh, from uh, Purdue, Doris wow. Hughes. And she's still working and she's uh, yeah. the laboratory yeah. vet there in, in DC for Howard yeah. University. And so, uh, that summer, uh, they both, you know, convinced me to really take a look at Purdue, and I came down. In fact, uh, Richard came down with me and and introduced me to some of his old professors, and uh, it felt like the right place. And I went back to vet school, finished that fourth year, and applied and was accepted. And two weeks after graduating from vet school, I was here at Purdue pursuing a PhD in pathology. Wow! And uh, wow. Yeah. Then, after, then afterward, I was invited to join the faculty and I uh, did that for eight years and then uh, was recruited to Michigan State University, where I was director of the veterinary diagnostic lab and uh, also uh, head of the pathobiology department. And then I did that collectively, those two jobs for about jobs for about 16 years and then came back to, to Purdue, invited me back as, as dean. And I've been dean for 16 and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> Seem to move in eights. Really. Yeah, move in eights. I'm not sure if I have 16 more in me. Anyway, but when I came here, when I came back to Purdue, I, uh, you know, had a wonderful provost who recruited me back, and uh, she and I talked a lot about, uh, you know, diversity in general, and she was trying to um, enhance diversity, expand diversity here at Purdue, uh, and I said, yeah, I would like to uh, come back to Purdue, but I want to uh, just put in a a diversity program you know i want yeah. a, a real solid program and i want you to support it <laughs> financially <laughs> <laughs> and uh she did she worked out the details and gave me the resources and and off we went and uh, established the uh, you know the office of diversity equity and inclusion hired a director and and then uh also established an office of engagement yeah, uh, appointed an associate dean, and those two offices worked very closely together. We uh, developed a strategic plan for the whole uh, college, and one of the strategic goals was to enhance diversity in our school and um, and in the profession in general. And uh, we off we we went, and then writing yeah. grants, getting federal dollars to help us with some of our programs, and then we developed a a a uh, strategic plan just for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, again, that was kind of the guide. And, you know, we, we had a, a diversity action committee that I appointed composed of faculty, staff, and students. And they were the, um, the architects of the plan and also worked with the implementation. And, and then the faculty bought into what we were trying to do. And uh, so, you know, when I arrived in 2007, uh, we had about I think a little bit on about six percent of our students were underrepresented students. Yeah. And now it's about about just about 30 percent. So, you know, we we worked we worked really hard and uh, it was a it was a team effort. And I think we've had, you know, we've had some impactful contributions to the profession. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to ask you about um so you went to Purdue to yeah. to pursue um, your PhD in uh, pathobiology, you said, right? Uh, in pathology. Pathology. All right. Mm -hmm. So, so what made you stay in academia? Surely, like you could have taken well, that degree I, and just. I, you know, that reason I stayed in academia was, um, I think it was that summer. You know, when I was a vet student, and I worked for in, you know, for this pharmaceutical company, the Upjohn Company, and it was a good environment, but I felt. It was a, a more, more restrictive environment. Mm. You know, we had to uh, check in with uh, the, the guard every day, and 
<laughs> then you, when you left, you know, you left, you couldn't come back at night. And, and then they, um, they decided what projects you were going to work on. And I thought, I, you know, I wanted to work in acad academia where I had more, more freedom uh, to work on what I wanted to work on and to be involved nationally with things that were really of interest to me, organizations. Uh, and I wanted to uh, have a, an impact on helping others achieve their dream. You know, yeah, veterinary students and yeah. graduate students, and to, and to me that was a, a a better career. When I finished Purdue, my, my PhD, I had job offers. I was lucky; I had job offers at a number of uh, veterinary schools around the country, and uh, two large uh, pharmaceutical companies, and oh, uh, turned them all down and stayed here, at Purdue. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's. I mean, you yeah. know, I think that that's really important, especially kind of exploring, you know, why people pursue careers in academia, especially right now, we have a big shortage in academia, particularly of clinicians. And, yeah. you know, we're just kind of, how do yeah. you get people to stay? And and certainly lots of people have this kind of interest, but how do you get them to stay? Well, how do you get them to stay? And, uh, you know, it just brings me a lot of pleasure. Like, uh, you know, this, uh, this well, yesterday, you know, I greeted the new class, my new class of 2027. And that's a fun day when you meet uh, young people who have been working so hard to achieve their dream, and now it's becoming a reality. Yeah. So I tell them every year that uh, I th my three favorite uh, days here at Purdue is the day that I meet the new class. Then when they become, uh, when they're transitioning from the third to the fourth year, we have white coat white ceremony. Coat. That's my second fun day. And then the third is graduation. So those three days bring me so much, uh, so much pleasure, yeah. and then interacting with young people who, uh, you know, they 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 want to do things, they want to follow their dreams. Uh, a lot of people helped me along the way, and I just thought that that was me. That was going to be more impactful than uh, working in industry, for example. Yeah. I could, I think, I could have had a, a great career in industry. I was, I was offered jobs at some of the major uh, companies at the time. Um, and but I but I wanted to have a different kind of an impact. I wanted to touch people uh, in a different way, I guess mm -hmm. one way to put it. Yeah. 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 So why is diversity and vet med so important to you? Well, again, it's important, it's important to me because of a few reasons. One is that I come across uh, a lot of uh, people, young people of color that have these dreams. Um, they want to, um, they, they want to be vets and I want to help them. So that's important to me. And then I know that um, they are likely to go back into their communities and, and serve their communities in ways that maybe those communities wouldn't be served otherwise. And so um, that's, in, that's, that's a couple of reasons. And another one is I think our profession is better, is a better profession if it represents everybody. And, uh, and truly we can't become, I don't believe a truly excellent profession unless it is diverse mm -hmm. with different perspectives and with different backgrounds and, and uh, tackling these, uh, you know, these challenges, these tough, tough issues that we have to tackle in veterinary medicine. You need people with all different perspectives and, and backgrounds. And I think that's good for the profession. And I, I love the profession. So I want what's best for it. So, um, so, you know, over the course of your time in vet med, um, or my talk is it's off camera being a little busybody today. <laughs> um, but um, you know, how have you seen things change? What have been kind of those big moments where you're like, oh, okay, we're really moving in a different direction now? Well, I think for me, as I've watched the profession evolve over the last uh, you know, 30, 40 years, during my my 40, during my career is that. Just watching the, the this bond between the human and the animal increase, you know that the human animal bond is stronger now than ever before. I believe in the history of mankind. To see people as they come into our hospitals and our hospital here, the, the emotional attachment that they have with their animals, 
and that that uh, uh, people, the animals are really members of the, of the family. They they are they truly are. And then to see the uh, the profession evolve, become you know more specialized. Um, you know this tendency, you know, more tendency towards uh, specialization is, is is certainly has happened. When I was in vet school, you know, most of the instructors were generalists. You know, they were not all these board certified. You name all the hundred specialists we had. You know, we all have them. And to to see that evolve, and then to see the uh, the gender change, you know, that's been an eye, you know, really uh, eye opening experience to see young women now can pursue their dreams of becoming a veterinarian when uh, the profession was not open to women back years ago. You know, when I was a vet student uh, in pre-vet, I'm not sure that I appreciated that. I just thought, you know, you you go to pre-vet, you apply to vet school and you get in, your gender did, shouldn't matter. But it was only until I got into vet school that I thought, oh, it had been a problem, you know, and was was what was changing. And to see that change over the years and to, to see it, it reach parity in the early 80s and then to see the numbers of women increased to, you know, where they are today, you know, in the late 80s and 90s, I guess there's 80%, you know, it's been that way forever, it seems. And to see, so that's been big, big changes. And to, to, and then now to see the, you know, corporate America's involvement in veterinary medicine, that's a huge change. And so, uh, even for me in the course of my career, just seeing um, aspects of organized veterinary medicine come around, um, you know, some were more recent than others, but when yeah. you still get your star, yeah. <laughs> I don't mean you can get here, um, but, you know, it's been, um, you know, we have lots of questions, like, where are the men now, and, and you know, is that, right a functional problem of, you know, admissions and selections and all that. And I'm like, no, that's a larger global societal <laughs> challenge with young men not going to, to higher ed. But, you know, there's still so many, there's still so many challenges, but yet we have these amazing markers of, of progress, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and for me, it's um, also staying in academia. I think, you know, we need, ro we need role models in academia yeah. and I have, uh, uh, mentored and, and worked with uh, uh, a number of um, uh, veterinarians of color, uh, hoping that they would stay in academia, but um, they've not, you know, they've gone on to industry, which is, you know, certainly it's, it's a good thing for, for them yeah. and their careers, but um, I, I'm all, often, often very concerned about who's going to come after me and, uh, and a few others that you see in academia. Yeah. You look around the profession in academic veterinary medicine, there's just not many uh, individuals of color in, yeah. in the faculty uh, that are going to serve as, you know, the future deans, associate deans, admit, you know, so I, I, I'm really concerned about that. Yeah, same, same. I think that, um, you know, one of um, the things we've been really talking about at AVMC is it's not too late. You can come back. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> right. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, you can come back and get all that freedom that Willie was talking about that yeah. you don't yeah. have at your corporate job. <laughs> yeah, but I, I just think you know, this academic career is just, you know, it's it's a, it's a career where you can just do a lots of things, and I think sometimes people do probably get burned out in academia, but. I find that my faculty many times that the heavy workloads that they carry sometimes it's because they've said yes to too many things. Mm. You know, I've just I found myself doing that early on in my career. You get all these, you know, if you if you if you are engaged and out there and you're good at what you do, opportunities come your way and you, you get invitations to do this or to do that, and you say yes, and you say, before you know it, you you know you're overloaded. There's nobody standing over you for the most part telling you, you can't do that. You can't do that. Don't accept that. It's up to you. And you uh, you, become, you stretch yourself too thin sometimes. Yeah. 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 I do see that. Um, I see that in my own life, but I also see it <laughs> with a lot of academics as no. well. And, and it's, um, 
yeah, you have to be pretty disciplined. You right? have to be disciplined. So, yes. Very yeah. disciplined. So, so you are the inaugural Frederick Douglass Patterson uh, awardee. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you found out and, and um, you know, what did you think when you heard you were being recognized with this award? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was sitting here at this desk uh, reading email, and that email <laughs> came through from uh, Janet Donlan, CEO of AVMA, uh, telling me that I had won this uh, wonderful award, and that it was the inaugural award. And I, I read it a couple of times and I was just stunned. Oh. It was, uh, it was uh, one of these moments in your one's uh, career that uh, you'll never forget. You know, it, it, just, it was such a warm feeling and I was happy and also thankful, you know, to be recognized and, and also thankful for the many wonderful colleagues that I've worked with here at Purdue and also at Michigan State that uh, made that possible because, you know, I didn't do it all by myself. I did a, a lot of people that worked uh, with me and uh, to, with the same objective. And uh, so all of, all of those emotions I, I started to feel. And then the thinking about Dr. Patterson, you know, for, he, he for, you know, as a Tuskegee graduate, I mean, he is a, a monumental role model, right? Yeah. He, he is something else. And to, even though I really, I never met him, uh, but uh, to hear the stories about him, to hear about him and uh, it, it, what he accomplished at the time that he accomplished it, you know, the third president of Tuskegee University. And, and I think about, you know, he, he when he was recruited to Tuskegee and then uh, became president uh, and then had the idea that he's going to start a vet school <laughs> in the deep south, right. about, about as deep as you can get. <laughs> And uh, 20 miles away from another vet school. <laughs> right. Well, right. 17 miles from another veterinary school that had been there, you know, I don't know, 50 years or longer before your school. And uh, and and then you you were going to start a vet school and you were going to recruit faculty <laughs> to, to the South when all the obstacles, you know, that were there yeah. to prohibit them from having careers and bring their families. I mean, that was that that took a lot of. <laughs> oh, I mean, think about what it took to do that I'm yeah. going to do that and, yeah. and he did it and to uh, you know where, you know, graduates that you know, where are they going to work people would say you know and because many places they couldn't get jobs right they, they were not going to be accepted and and that's the reason a lot of the Tuskegee graduates early on they worked for the government because there was not unless you started a veterinary practice in a, usually in a predominantly uh, black community, you were not going to be able to work as a veterinarian. But just think about that. I mean, that took a, a, a great vision and just a lot of courage, yeah, and fortitude, fortitude to make it to make it happen. Yeah. And so, um, and then you know, and then what he did in starting the United Negro College Fund, and uh, he brought together all his colleagues from the you know the other um, hi historically black colleges. To buy into that and how uh, he navigated the uh, challenges with segregation and all of that was just uh he, well he was a giant and yeah and great, greatly accomplished and i think you know as I, I thought about it i said you know he really hasn't received the recognition that he should have received you know he's yeah. he he is uh just been a giant in the veterinary profession but was never really recognized uh, fully, and I've been so happy to see Iowa State, you know, uh, really recognize one of their most illustrious graduates. Yes, and I would yes. hope that Cornell would would do the same, since that he got his PhD from from Cornell. Yeah, y'all hear that up there yeah. in Ithaca. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I, um, I will also admit that we're low key a uh, little disappointed that we didn't think of. Uh, Snatch well, award first. <laughs> you know, right. You know, think about he's connected more with, well, with us, veterinary medical education than, you know, <laughs> any other organization. But that's okay. But we're, we're happy. We're Absolutely. so delighted. So delighted. Right. And I mean, I think that, that folks really, um, 
don't really have an appreciation for all of the um, opportunities that Tuskegee created um, for Black veterinarians or veterinarians of color in general. I mean, there's so, I mean, there's so many firsts, right? That came out of Tuskegee, so many firsts. Um, I mean, you know, our colleague our, um, and, and my uh, kind of practical uncle, uh, Evan in Ohio, the first like Black veterinarian right, yeah. in, in Ohio, uh, Michael Blackwell, first dean at a predominantly white institution. Um, you, I mean, it's just, you know, there's just so many um amazing professionals that have come out of that institution so so many uh uh lisa you're right and you know and when i you know when i moved to well when i went to tuskegee as an undergraduate student you know that was the city was just vibrant you know it has changed over the years but that was like the mecca for black professionals and you know, I, I saw my first black lawyer, my first black doctor, my first yeah. black dentist, my first black veterinarian. You just go down the list. Yeah. And I saw them all there in, in Tuskegee and, uh, you know, first black politician. I remember when I was there as a freshman, it was, uh, I remember it was a, it was a mayoral, mayoral campaign and, you know, the first African-American uh, uh, mayor was elected, and I was, uh, I think, either first or second year undergraduate student at Tuskegee. So, you know, that was a that was a great environment. And then, you know, we also saw the emergence of uh, the the Commodores. <laughs> they they were just getting started there, and Lionel Richie and his group were yeah. you know, on campus, and they they were a local band, and they were just getting there, getting their started, and to see them uh, develop into what they became. So wow. that was just a, a, a really a fun time at Tuskegee. And, um, it, you know, looking back on it now, you know, you cherish those memories. Those memories. But at the time, you didn't, you didn't, you couldn't sense the significance of it all. It just felt, you know, it felt natural and normal. Yeah. Yeah. You're just going to school. Just going to school and it's worrying about Richie around the corner. You're know, worrying about the next exam. You know, worried about right. <laughs> there's Lionel Richie, but he wasn't really Lionel Richie yeah, yeah, then, yeah. right? Like he was <laughs> right, just... <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So we do have a question um, from our audience, um, and uh, so we we'll talked a little bit about academia. Um, and the need for faculty. Yes, if you are out there as a practicing veterinarian, we need you, come on back. Um, I'm gonna keep saying that like everybody gets for a while. But um, so here is the question uh, from Dr. Susan Williams. What do you think about the increase in veterinary schools happening now and keeping your faculty instead of them leaving for a new school? <laughs> what do I think about all of that? Well, I can tell you, I think a lot about it because I wonder where, it, you know the new schools are going to get the faculty because you know we we have challenges here at Purdue and I, I think many of the vet schools do and and recruiting uh, specialists and retaining them and I, I just I don't know where this is going to end how this is going to end up because it's just not enough and there's projections of really significant shortages of veterinarians and veterinary specialists and uh and then, you know, the new schools, uh, as far as I know, they they all are going to be distributed with the distributed process, which means they aren't going to be training uh, residents. And mm -hmm. for so only the existing schools now are going to be the ones expected to populate uh, well to train uh, specialists. Well, of course, there's some training programs in the private sure. sector, too, but not enough. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really concerned about the future of the profession yeah. and what's going to happen and you know is you know new schools are potentially going to further dilute the current schools in terms of faculty yeah and there's some specialties that you know we just can't hardly recruit anymore mm. so i i don't have the answer to that but i certainly do worry a lot of, about it yeah yeah i know there has been some um uh worry expressed um i just responding to a, a press call last week and some worry expressed about whether or not there's enough students. And I'm like, oh no, well, <laughs> there's students. We got plenty of students. You know, we got plenty of applicants yeah. Um, yeah. and our applicant pool is very competitive. It's very deep. That isn't the issue. It's, it's, we can get the students there. It's 
who's going to be there when the students get there? <laughs> that's, well, that's, the that's, that's the big, that's the big worry is that yeah. who's, who's going to train the students? Yeah. yeah. Because I mean, I, I just look, I mean, when our residency program here at Purdue, just about all of them, when they finish, they go immediately into the private sector. Mm -hmm. We have very few that uh, seek out jobs in academia, no matter how hard we try to direct them in that direction. It's just uh, that's where they flock to. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, as we get ready to kind of wind down a little bit, what do you want the profession to know about you at this in this chapter here? What do you what do you want folks to know about Dean Willie Reed? Well, I guess to, to know that if it's not obvious that I, you know, care deeply about the profession, that I believe strongly in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, uh, you know, giving uh, people uh, a fair shot at pursuing their, their dream. And I hope they know that I have worked hard to, to, to make that happen to give people an opportunity to, to pursue their dream because I, no one really can do it alone. And I have a, a real deep sense of fairness to treat people well and uh, and help them. So I hope that's what they would you know see in me if they you know if they know me. Um, that's what I've always tried to try to do in my career. Yeah. And what do you want the naysayers? Because you know, even though they act like they don't watch the podcast. <laughs> Or no, listen to the podcast. Like, yeah, I, I know we probably, as they say, preaching to the choir here. But <laughs> um, I just think the naysayers need to know that if you really care deeply about, you know, the profession meeting the needs of society, the society needs uh, veterinarians from all walks of life, all backgrounds, no matter what, you know, whatever the background you can name, uh, the profession is better off because of that. Talent comes in all flavors, folks. That's right. Talent comes yeah. in all flavors. So we do have one last comment in the chat. Thank you for being an awesome mentor. Oh, well, whoever that was, thank you. <laughs> Susan Williams. Oh, Susan, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Susan has been great. She's, so, she's, one, she's one that uh, decided to pursue a, a career in, in academia. And has done so very, very well at the University of Georgia and so very proud of her. Now she's a full professor and uh, doing some great things down there. Yeah. Awesome. So any parting words? Uh, well, uh, just thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, share some of my my thoughts about DEI and, and the profession. And uh, to those who are listening, I would ask you to to really you know, keep doing what you're doing, uh, trying to make our profession better, uh, give your time to young people and help them, give them opportunity to pursue their, their dreams and work with them um, and stay involved, stay active and don't, don't give up. Don't give up, don't give up. Well, again, at the top of the show, I um, I, I said how much you, know, you mean to me. I want to just reiterate that you've been um, just such a wonderful part of my life and my career and a great mentor as well. And um, thank you. And I am, I could not be happier to see you um, Oh, wait, here, there's another question. I can't, I, I mean, I couldn't be happy to see you receive this type of recognition. Um, oh, oh, well, okay, we do have another question. Like, people are oh, not okay. ready to let go yet. <laughs> okay. So, um, do you think the abolition of affirmative action will affect the profession? I think it's quite possible that it, it will, but, you know, it's still early and, uh, it, you know, we know that our profession needs to be uh, diverse. And so we got to find ways to make sure that it happens within the confines of the, the law. And we're gonna do that. But in the short term, it, for some schools, some places, it very well could. Yeah. But I, I think we, you know, we, uh, we don't throw our hands up and stop. Uh, we know that we're doing the right thing. And uh, we, we want to, we're gonna encourage young people to consider our profession. We're gonna help them uh, prepare well 
and we're going to make sure that our processes are free of biases as, as much as possible. And if we have a robust, diverse pool of candidates, we ought to have a robust, diverse group of veterinary students. That's kind of my uh, philosophy. Yeah. I think we're going to have to just, you know, just work hard. We work within the confines of the law. Yeah. Which is what we've always done. Yeah. And there are, you know, states for for whom this is this is old hat, right? This is um, right. Michigan, yeah. you know, Michigan, California, Washington. Um, this these things um, have been in place in those states for <laughs> decades <laughs> in California. Yeah. And so, um, you know, there's certainly models out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, there are models out there, and you know, and probably we're gonna make we're gonna invent new models. Yeah, because uh, you know. And we, this is the right thing to do. The profession should be open to everybody. Every you know, students should be encouraged, supported, and uh, given a shot. That's mm -hmm. my philosophy. Yes, same. All right. Well, Dean Willie Reed, thank you. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being on the show today. And um, again, congratulations on um, the. Frederick Douglass Patterson Award from AVMA. It is, um, again, I just, I'm so happy. Uh, I was so excited when I heard. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Lisa. Sure. I'm uh, really touched by your comments. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So, everybody, this has been another episode of AVMC's Diversity and Inclusion on Air. Um, to my guest, Dean Wee Reed, thank you again for joining me for this episode. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app and uh, follow uh, AVMC on um, all the social media challenges um, channels. So, um, our next show uh, will be airing in just a few days. Actually, we'll be focusing on trauma-informed teaching. Um, at the undergraduate level, we know that um, three out of every four undergraduates with students have a um, had at least one um, episode of major trauma um, in their formative years. And so um, they, you know, we know that that also exists in veterinary medicine. And so we're kind of really thinking about and, and um, going to talk about how does that impact um, learning and maybe what can we do as educators to um, improve that process. So be sure to stay tuned. Um, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And we will see you next time.